Yes. You found the plate? What about that section? Get started! I would like to make it very clear that I have the loudest voice. Please stay where you are. My voice projects. Hyde Park Speaker's Corner has been invaded by religious nutcases and maniacs, all promising you a one-way ticket to heaven, whether they are Jewish, Muslim, or Christian. Look around you. Look at that nutcase. Think about this. When you die, you're not going to be with him for five minutes. You're going to be with him forever. Good luck to you. That's your own fault if you believe that nonsense. Everyone has the right to believe in whichsoever God they choose. We are all the same people, regardless of sex, race, creed, color, sexual orientation, political persuasion, religious denomination, or stupidity. <laughs> now, I want to ask you this, think about it. If God is all powerful, if God is all knowing, if God is omniscient, God is omnipotent, then why would he choose fools like this to speak on his behalf? <laughs> he could have chosen me. But he refused. My friends, think about it. Look at God now. I have nothing against Christianity, Islam, or Judaism. But think about it. I do not want to go to heaven. Because heaven, according to the books, are places full of white people. <laughs> Am I lying? No. I have never seen a black angel in my life. Never. No, 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 and I know true. you conniving no, white people. If true. I make it to heaven, you white people will use me for security purposes. <laughs> Hell no! Look after your pearly gates by yourselves. I ain't going there. I ain't having none of it. We are all the same people. So why do you discriminate in your heaven? Okay, hands up if you're Christian. All white people. <laughs> I'm, I'm not discriminating none. I challenge any of you white people to tell me the name of one prophet from the Bible who came from Europe. Take your time. <laughs> All of the prophets came from Africa and Asia. The issue is you Christians are always saying Jesus Christ is going to come back to England, but come back to the world again. You say Jesus Christ is going to come back to earth, but think about it. If Jesus Christ came back to earth today and arrived in London, England, he would need a visa. <laughs> if he arrives in America, they're sending him straight to Guantanamo. <laughs> Let's be honest about this. Yeah, you're right. Let's be honest. We as human beings are stupid. We are alleged to be the most intelligent creatures, the most intelligent beings. But look at how we fight murder, maim, killing, whatnot to each other. Look at how we create all of these false, fake, and illusionary ideologies that divide us. Hands up if you're Muslim. Hands up if you're Christian. Hands up if you're Jewish. 
Don't worry, I'll protect you from the stone. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one Jew, several Muslims, several Christians. Whether you are a Jew, you believe in Adam and Eve. Muslims, Adam and Eve. Christians, Adam and Eve. Jews, you claim Abraham introduced religion. So do you Muslims. So do you Christians. As Jews, you believe Abraham brought you laws. So do you Muslims. So do you Christians. So why the hell are you fighting one another, you bunch of stupid bastards? You should be fighting me. I don't believe in any of that bullshit. But oh no, you fight each other when you all worship the same God. And then you Jews, you Muslims and Christians are all arguing about the race of Jesus Christ. Jews say Jesus was a Jew. Muslims, Jesus was a Muslim. Christians, Jesus was a Christian. Let me end this nonsense once and for all. Jesus was not a Jew. He was not a Muslim. He was not a Christian. Jesus Christ was a Jamaican. <laughs> Jesus Christ was always saying, what, brother? You're cool. I agree. Peace and love. Jesus Christ. Look at it. Jesus had to be Jamaican. Look, he was a qualified doctor, a wine merchant, fully qualified carpenter, and he was still unemployed. Had to be Jamaican. What else can he have been? Look at it. My brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, let us begin to understand each other more. Let's not try and create these fictitious divides which keep us where we are for either economic reasons or political reasons. As a black individual, as an African, I recognize that I wasn't enslaved because of racism <coughs> that perpetuated my continued enslavement. But we were enslaved, traditionally, because of resources, capitalism. We became capital, and that's when we became slaves. It could have happened to anyone. In fact, the word slave is derived from Slav, Russian. Nothing to do with us. We've all been slaves at one stage or another. But let's look at the reality of the way we are living today and the world we're living in today. Let's look at the destruction being wrought around the world, whether it be in Lebanon, Afghanistan, Iraq, or the attempted attacks against, or the, the planned attacks against Iran. Let's ask ourselves some of the most potent questions which are being debated today. Last week, Jack Straw, the former foreign secretary, stood up and said that he would prefer it if Muslim women removed their veils. Well, I would actually prefer it if women remove their bras and knickers. But what I prefer is neither here nor there. <laughs> who is Jack Straw to tell Muslim women who wear the burqa or the hijab because of their own cultural preference or reasons that they should not wear the burqa or the hijab? Now, let's be honest to each other, first of all. Let's be honest. Hands up, those of you who believe that Islam is oppressive to women. Let's be honest. You bunch of oh. <laughs> Only one. Do you believe Islam is oppressive towards women? Madam, do you? Yes. Sir, do you believe Islam is oppressive towards women? No idea. Then what is this bloody government talking about? If we have a consensus here. But let's, madam. No, no. <laughs> it's all right. It's in black you and white. It must be true. <laughs> <laughs> and we're being honest because all we're doing is discussing and debating. None of our opinions are necessarily right. They're just our opinions. Sir, why do you believe Islam is oppressive towards women? The way they treat their women. The way they treat their women. What way do Muslims treat the women? Well, not all. Not all. Not all. Not all. But some treat their women like third class citizens. Some, he says, some Muslims treat their uh, treat their women 
like third class citizens. I would go so far as to say that's not just Muslims, that's man in general. Men in general treat women like third class citizens, whether they're Muslim or not. Where are you from, sir? I'm from Africa originally. Africa originally. And are you suggesting that in Africa we treat our women any different? They do. In what way? More respect. More respect. And so what is the what is the litmus test of respect? Depends on individual perception. Depends on individual perception. So, simply because someone is a Muslim, it doesn't mean that it is a given that he's going to ill-treat his wife. It is all down, as you suggest, to the individual. My father was a Christian, or at least he'd like to think so. <laughs> but he mistreated my mother. He abused her. He beat her. It was not because he was a Muslim why he did this. He did this because he could. And it is the nature of man, whether it be Muslim or African or English, you look at it in this country. It was only since Margaret Thatcher came to power. Margaret Thatcher, you remember her? The milk snatcher. <laughs> it is only since the advent of Margaret Thatcher that women were allowed to buy houses in this country. But let's still stick with the ambit that Islam is oppressive towards women. Madame, why? <laughs> I'm not here to talk. I'm just here to listen. I'm sorry. So I'm only here to listen too. I'm standing here talking to myself and you all gather around me. <laughs> 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 Some people will suggest that Islam is oppressive towards women because women have to wear the burqa or the hijab. But you do not look at it from the context of culture. It's not only Muslims who cover themselves from head to toe. In many Asian societies, many Hindus will wear the sari. Culture. In Europe, Look at how your nuns are dressed. Aren't they covered from head to toe? I know many Caribbean people. The woman will not enter a church without covering her head. Because, madame, it does not just say so in the Quran. It says so in the Bible. Leviticus 11 verse 4. That woman should cover her head when worshipping. And so people translate the texts of whether it be the Torah, the Quran or the Bible, literally. But look at it. Madam, my madam, do you believe that you should have the right as a woman to do what you like? And wear what you like? Madam, do you believe as a woman you should be able to do what you like and wear what you like? What in what context? I think there's appropriateness for different situations. What's appropriate to you might not be appropriate to someone else. Well, I accept that, I accept that, I accept that. Because you're saying what's not appropriate. And that's exactly what they want to do. They, they see what's appropriate for one or what's appropriate for the other. But in, for many of you in the West who suggest that Islam is oppressive because women have to wear the burqa or the hijab, think about this. You in the West, you assume you have the right to do what you like, but you don't. Here in the West, as a man, as a male, I can lift my shirt and show you my wonderful nipples. <laughs> can you do that as a woman without being arrested for indecent exposure? No, you cannot. So there are limitations limitations upon what you as women in the West can do and can't do and it is the same in Islam in other countries around the world not all Islamic countries suggest you should wear the hijab or the burqa so I am saying to you there are poles determined by the laws determined by the man of the land and that dictates or determines what's appropriate or inappropriate but we in the West like to assume arrogance. 
and scoff down our nose at everyone else. In the West, you assume yourselves to be so arrogant that you can dictate amongst everyone else what and what they shouldn't do. Oh, look at these Muslims. They're immoral. They have four wives. Fuck you. At least they marry their mistresses. In England, you just fuck them. <laughs> I mean, how many scandals do you need? Even David Blunkett, a blind man, can feel his way to some pussy. What are we saying? Let's be honest about this. I personally do not believe that man, listen to what I'm saying before you shout me down. I personally do not believe that man is naturally Monogamous. If you're here with your girlfriend or your wife, I apologize for putting you in hot water. But it still does not negate the argument. Man is not naturally monogamous. And so you go and play these certain games. We as men are playing life by air. So we're making up the rules as we go along. Something happens, let's make a law about it. There is a loophole, let's make another law about it. Let's look at the way the world is today. Let's look at Iraq. Let's look at Afghanistan. Let's look at Lebanon. And let's look at the petty policies that we debate as human beings, whether it be the Burqa or otherwise. Let's look at how much money has been stolen, appropriated from Iraq. Let's look at how many resources have been stolen. Let's look at how many people have had to die to liberate Iraq. You're an Iraqi. Hands up if there are any more Iraqis here. Don't be afraid. I'll protect you from the American. I have news. I have news. My brother. Iraq is on fire. Hundreds, although they declare scores of thousands, we know that hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, butchered, maimed. What stability is there in Iraq? I know you first of all supported the invasion of Iraq. Do you still support the invasion? You still support the invasion? Tell me, sir, why do you support the invasion? Because America they freedom in Iraq. Hold on. He says, he says because, because the Americans brought freedom. Now forgive me. Let me as a Jamaican debate to you as an Iraqi. Sir, and I don't wish to separate. Because you're all Iraqi people regardless. Are you Shia? You're Kurdish. You're Kurdish. You're Kurdish. Just Kurdish. You're not even Iraqi. Kurdish. Kurdish. Only Kurdish. Well, let's understand the argument of the Kurds of Iraq. Bearing in mind that the Kurds of Iraq were bombed themselves. It wasn't only in, uh, in, on, uh, in August of 1988. Sorry, April of 1988 that the Kurds were gassed um, by, um, by Saddam at Alabja. It was not in solely in 1938, because you, the Kurds, have been gassed in 1920 by Winston Churchill. Did he not use mustard gas on you? Did not Churchill and the British use mustard gas against the Kurdish people? Or oh, perhaps you don't know that part of your history yet. Winston Churchill, when the Kurdish people of Iraq they weren't even Iraqi then, because Iraq had not been divided up. The Middle East was devised by the Europeans over dinner, tea, a pen, a ruler, and a map. They decided to create Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and all of the rest of the Middle East. And they deliberately left off Kurdistan. Why? Because the Kurds had been fighting the British, declaring themselves independent. You weren't fighting Saddam, you fought the British. And because you fought the British, 
the British deliberately left Kurdistan, left off the rights of your people. So to this very day, the Kurdish people are scattered around Iraq, Iran, Turkey and Syria, scattered without a homeland. And let me explain to you, sir, why you support the American invasion. As if I were Kurdish, I too might support this invasion. Because this is the closest you have ever got to attaining independence as a free and independent Kurdistan. The closest you have ever got. Can't you, you can say that Kurdistan has existed or a Kurdish enclave, an independent Kurdish enclave, has existed not since the invasion of America or by the US in 2003. You as a Kurd have had your independence since 1991. 1991 is when you have had your independence. When did you gain your independence? In 1990, when the Americans invaded Kuwait, bombed Iraq. 14 of the 19 provinces of Iraq rose up against Saddam. The Kurds in the north and the Shias in the south. Baghdad would have fallen in weeks, weeks. But the US government, terrified that the Shia majority would ally itself with Iran, decided to back Saddam Hussein to exterminate the Shias in the south. And they allowed you your state of autonomy in the north. And you believe that you will one day have this free Kurdistan. And you might want to declare Kirkuk as your economic financial capital. But that will never happen as long as Turkey is backed by America. Do you hear me? You have it already? My friend, I agree. You have it already. Are you Kurdish, sir? Yes, of course, sir. My friend, I have no dispute that you have it already but it does not exist in fact. What we have, as we have seen all the motions moving towards it, the federalization of Iraq. What was that? The federalization of Iraq, in a sense, is the breakup of Iraq, of which you, the Kurds, have wanted your independent Kurdistan. Left nothing for the Shias or the Sunnis. Just dividing land. Listen to how the media divided Iraq. They said, when this war was starting, they said there are 60% Shia, 20% Sunni, 20% Kurd. Can you not see the mechanism of divide and rule even in that statistic? They broke down the Kurds as an ethnic group and broke down the Shias and the Sunnis as religious groups. Sir, as a Kurd, you are Sunni. You are a Sunni, yet they did not tell you 60% Shia, 40% Sunni. No, they divided the Kurds into another subgroup, another subsection. It's All like if... Hold on, my brother. You don't care about Sunni or Shia. Sir, Arabs is Arabs. Arabs is Arabs. Arabs is Arabs. Sir, I only debate with logic. Hold on, here he says, Saddam Hussein. Hold on. He says, he says Saddam Hussein divided them into a subgroup. Fuck you. <laughs> I got a you question. Yeah, you, gonna, you, you, might, you might tell me, you might tell me the same thing, but I'm gonna ask you. That. Look, yeah, you, you, the you know, you always talk shit. You always talk shit about America. I know Bush has brought brought the reputation of it to America, huh? but talk about what about this country? Huh? Don't you find any? Don't you find any errors here? Hold on, hold on. This might be Saddam. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, you say, what about this country? I mean, yeah, I, I, I okay, my friend, said, I'm going to get back to you, but let me just answer this man's question first. Just what errors do you find, please? As a black brother, he has to take precedence. Sir, you say, what about this country? This country means shit. There is no more Great Britain. Tony Blair has no power in Europe. That's why, that's why he backed Bush. Because quite frankly, really what it should be 
is Europe should have and defined it for itself its own foreign policy. But it hasn't. And that's one of the reasons why Bush has been able to masquerade around the world as a false statesman. Because Europe has not defined a foreign policy objective of its own. They wanted to do away with NATO. The Europeans said, let us form our own European army. Who, who opposed it? Bush opposed it and Blair blocked it. Every move Europe has made to define itself independently, Bush, Blair has blocked it. Why has Blair blocked it? Because Blair, Britain, had no more power around the world. The people who controlled Europe were the French and the Germans. Bush, Blair, sorry, that's Bush, Blair, same fucking thing. <laughs> Blair had no presence on the international stage. Before September the 11th, 2001. Where had Blair visited at a world statesman? He went to Brixton once, paid two visits to Sedgwick, went to Birmingham, and I think he might have gone to Spain on a holiday. No one, Blair did not have any international presence. No economic voice within Europe. No political standing on the world stage. But he gambled that by backing Bush, he can get the crumbs of respectability off the table and it worked because since Blair sold his backside to Bush everyone has acknowledged Blair on the world stage albeit as Bush's poodle but his poodle nonetheless Britain had no power Britain Blair is a very intelligent shrewd and calculating politician in fact I will go so far as to say it is a very rare in British politics for this, for this country to have such a visionary leader. Blair far exceeded those that of Winston Churchill, even that of Thatcher, because he's a thinker. Well, not a strong I don't man. support Blair, yeah, but let's man. acknowledge what Britain had as a prime minister. Yeah. He's a thinking, calculating intellectual. A man who has strategies and plans and knows how to execute them. That's what Britain had. The last person before that, whether we liked her or not, was Thatcher. And she didn't have half of what Blair had. This is just being real with you. Well, and, 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 and Hold up. Strength, what counts? Strength. What My counts? friend. So Blair backed Bush, yeah, Blair. recognizing that the war in Iraq was illegal. Regardless of your campaign, of course, I support the rights of the Iraqi people and the Kurds independently for their own right to uh, self-determination. But on a real stage of what it is, and we get back to where we were, as I was saying, that in 1991 the Kurds became independent because 14 of the 18 provinces rose up against Saddam and would have crushed Saddam within weeks. But simply because of America's fear, they allow to come back. Blair, as a statesman, what has Blair done? Blair has allied himself with George W. Bush on his maniacal campaign to colonize and to spread their brand of neo-colonialism, imperialism to Iraq. And that has begun to come undone. <laughs> Sir, do we realize that there was a 23 billion fund set aside for Iraqis, of your own money, the oil for food program. Remember that, sir. 23 billion dollars of Iraqi money was set aside to rebuild Iraq. Their own money, not international aid, Iraqi money. Where did that money go? Who spent it? The American administration spent it. Corruption at the highest level. Out of $23 billion, they handed in the, to the interim government $3 billion. Where did the other 20 go? It went to companies like Halliburton. These corrupt American organizations. Halliburton was formerly run by the Vice President Dick Cheney. Let's look at these things. These are not conspiracies. Let's look at world leaders, Ahmed Kazai of Afghanistan. Where did he come from? Didn't he come from the Halliburton stables? What did Tony Blair do? Tony Blair sold his soul. 
because he knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew what he was doing would cost the lives of thousands. But as long as it's not the lives of white people, we're all right. Non-white lives are always expendable. Let's be honest about it. We hear in the media, Darfur. Oh, let's do something about Darfur. Is Darfur a genocide? Hell no. Darfur is a civil war. Are there any Sudanese people here? Anyone from Darfur or that region? Sir, you're from the region. Would you define the situation as a genocide? You can contradict me. Do you, would you define it as a genocide or a civil war? I wouldn't define it as a genocide. You, sorry? I wouldn't. You wouldn't define it as a genocide. I wouldn't define it as civil war. Uh, you wouldn't define it as civil war. What would you define it as? Okay, it is cattle rustling, which happens... Sorry, it is? Cattle rustling, which happens everywhere where there are cattle rear in, in, uh, in Kenya. In Kenya? In, uh, Somalia, when Somalia was not in, in the yes. civil war, and uh, in part of Ethiopia as well, Ethiopia. Yeah. people go, they go to other camps and then they take their cattle and run away with them up. Some acquire them, fire out, and they kill shooting. And you're from the region? From the region. So that, uh, that cattle wrestling started even before the, uh, the birth of the current Then how president. come so many people have died as a result? Exactly. And then it is, I attended one of the conferences where they said, oh, Darfur, there are two million displaced in Darfur. Yes. That is wrong. That is not... Are you saying that, sorry, you attended a conference where they said two million people in Darfur are displaced? Yes. Is that and true? It, it's not true. It's, Darfur is a small region. Can I stop you there, sir? Okay. Then how is it we get this information seeping into the public arena? Why don't you ever ask yourself this question? Why is it that you have Western governments talking about we have to do something about Lebanon? We have to get Western troops there. And then when it comes to Africa, they will tell us about Zimbabwe. Five white people died in Zimbabwe and it was front page news for six months. Every day, all of the world's mainstream media, El Monde, The Times, BBC, CNN, Sky. What made Zimbabwe, when five white people get to the top of the news agenda? When over the last four years, four million black people died in the Congo, but we never heard anything about it. Did we hear anything about the UN? About peacekeepers? Did we hear anything from that damn chicken bone which Dr. Kofi Annan? Where was he? Where was his voice? Where was, oh, we need to do something about the Congo? You never heard of it. Did you hear something about Liberia? Only when the rebels were about to seize Liberia did the Americans say, well, what should we do about it? Let's send some African troops in. So why are the West so hyper about getting troops to Darfur? Why are they so prank about bringing Darfur to the top of the media agenda? I believe that Darfur, something should be done. Yet let's not be deluded. The situation in Darfur is nothing more nor less than the same argument that was used to invade Iraq. Oil. 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 Darfur is rich in oil. They don't give a fuck about the black people of Darfur. Since when have they given a damn hoot about who's dying? You will hear them talk about Darfur. How many times have they mentioned to you the plight of the Aboriginal people of Australia? Do you hear about them? Look at the Aboriginals of Australia. Second class citizens in their own damn country. They had a higher child mortality rate than that of Bangladesh. They're suffering from diseases which are curable to the white population. 22% of them are in prison when they only make up 3% of the prison population, of the uh, mainstream population. Do we ask ourselves those questions? Do we ask ourselves about the population of Tasmania, which was totally wiped out in a successful genocide? No. Instead, when you hear the mainstream press, when you hear the puppets of the United Nations stand up and begin talking about an African country, 
that something needs to be done and we need to send troops there and we need to send aid. Whenever you hear those ramblings coming from the white mainstream, you know something's going down because they don't give a fuck about black Africa. Hands up if you're Somali. Look at what they're talking about for Darfur. They're saying, let's go in there. It's a humanitarian mission. Humanitarian mission. Was that that what the Americans used to go into Somalia? It was humanitarian aid. They said the to help Somalia. And on, on other phase, Somalia has large deposit of petroleum. To help Somalia, store law and order, and get the petroleum as well. And get the, petro and get the petroleum. Yeah. It's all so here we have it. We had the day we were talking about humanitarian aid. In the process of America going to Somalia, they killed 5,000, in excess of 5,000 Somalians. Virtually wiped out the Somali leadership. I think you're more. Sir, I'm only being conservative. You say more. Kill more. Sir, I'm only being conservative. I'm saying 5,000 for argument's sake. Those of you who are from Somalia who know more about the facts on the ground or the region, you will of course say there's much, much more. But let's just look at what it was. They said they went to Somalia for humanitarian aid, to, to administrate a humanitarian aid. How can you go to give out humanitarian aid and kill 5,000 civilians in the process? How do you go to distribute aid and wipe out part of the Somali leadership in the process? Look at the hypocrisy. Look at what's happening in Somalia today. What happened? The US-backed warlords of Mogadishu were forced out. And only when they were forced out do you get the AU, African Union, talking about, let's do something about this. Only when the American-backed warlords are forced out do you have the UN saying, let's do something about the Somali situation. Only because the US-backed US forces were routed. What has taken place since then? 5,000 Ethiopian troops crossed the border into Somalia. Do we hear that in the media? Do we hear about the invasion? No. Who has the power to keep that out of the press? So let's not delude ourselves. You don't give a fuck about black Africa and you don't give a fuck about non-white Asia. So don't feed us this spiel about we're going to Darfur to help. Fuck you and your help. You're a bunch of armchair Big Mac munching or mongering barbarians. Let's just be honest. We are all the same people, regardless of sex, race, creed, color, sexual orientation or political persuasion. My life is worth no more nor less than anyone else's life here. When will we be able to The world's best manner is worthless. Used for political purposes to gain political advantage. Why is America focusing now on Africa? Because America's main plan initially was to go to Iraq to secure that oil. And only when that plan became unraveled have they begun to look to Africa to secure Africa's oil. Don't you remember recently whereby Mark Thatcher and Lord Archer, Jeffrey Archer, were involved in, a, in a, an attempted coup in Equatorial Guinea? What was that all about? How come we never heard about that in the mainstream media? Imagine, this, one of this country's most prominent prime ministers, her son, Mark Thatcher, who has always courted controversy from that old 1980s um, Saudi Arabian um, arms deal worth billions. So here we have Margaret Thatcher's son, who's an arms dealer, whose name is brought up and he's implicated in a coup to, to, to get rid of a president in, in, in Africa simply because they have oil and they want to replace them with a friendly government to exploit the oil. And that, since they have oil and they want to replace them with a friendly government to exploit the oil. And that situation is not brought up in the mainstream media. Imagine! It didn't went back to his mama's house. OJ Simpson kills one white woman yeah. and it's all over the world. Front page, we get to see the trial live. But here we have an attempted coup to kill scores of thousands of black people in Africa and we hear nothing about it. I am not trying to divide this situation into black or white. I am being real about the low commodity value we have as black people. What about the Chinese? What about the Chinese?
My friend, the Chinese in Africa, have a very prominent presence and a very prominent role to play. In fact, China right now is actually balancing the books. If you look at why America went to Iraq in the first place, you will see China in the background. You will see India in the background. Because no one actually reckoned that China was going to industrialize so quickly. That's why we have this scramble for oil right now. China is industrializing at a rate which is depleting the oil reserves. Look at it. OPEC estimates that there is enough oil to last the planet another 70 years. Western experts estimate that the oil supplies will only last 30 to 40 years. That's Western experts. And now you have joining within that pack China with over a billion people industrializing. Then you have India, over a billion people industrializing. No one saw, no one foresaw that there would be this strain upon the oil reserves. So now there's a scramble to get as much oil as they can. Look at Afghanistan. What was that all about? Securing oil from the Caspian Sea. Look at what America, well, look at what the US did. And the heroin. Well, you know, fuck the heroin. <laughs> look at what they did. They said we will only go to Afghanistan temporarily to get rid of the Taliban. They went to Afghanistan. They now have permanent bases in, in Afghanistan. They went to Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. They went to Pakistan. They went to all the fucking stands. <laughs> No stand was missed out. Why? Because within these regions, they are rich in oil. They are trying to block off the Russians from ever attaining regional or even global influence again. They're trying to block off the Chinese from expanding into Africa, into the Arab world. Look at it recently. The Chinese have been buying oil from Venezuela. Venezuela is America's third largest importer. They've gone to Cuba. They're throughout Africa. The Chinese are everywhere. Buying up what they can. What do you have? You have you, do, you, do you have some marijuana? Yes, sir. I will have some. Everything that's for sale is being bought by the Chinese. And bear in mind, in England, you know how... So just think about this. Back in the day, the British controlled over one-third of the globe. One-third. And the British population today is at the highest it's ever been. There are 60 million people. Over 60 million people living in Britain. And look at how ubiquitous the British were. All over the planet. Now, imagine the Chinese with 1.3 billion Chinese people all over the place buying up the place the cheapest labor pools what has the west done in europe now you're becoming unemployed what do they do because of capitalism because of industry you want to phone your bank you're getting through to india hello how are you or can i have your bank details please no problem you look at you go to mcdonald's kentucky you buy a happy meal where are the toys made? In China. Where's this made? China. Where's this made? China. The Chinese are saturating the markets to the point that you in the West now have to revamp your free trade laws. Look at it. Look at what's happening. Let's be honest. Let's be open. Let's be fair. The world is changing and we can see America's plan, America's scheme. Hands up if you're American. Don't be ashamed. No one wants to confess to being an American, to having a warmongering alcoholic and cocaine slaughter as their president. Look at George Bush, that maniacal nutcase. Look at the wars around the world. America said they went to Iraq to liberate the Iraqi people. 
Show me one instance in history whereby the Americans have gone anywhere to liberate anybody. No. Sorry? No. Vietnam. He says Vietnam. <laughs> what are you smoking and where can I buy some? <laughs> Vietnam, look at it, everywhere the US has been, and this is not an anti-American platform, I'm anti-American policy, but let's look at the policies of America, they went to Korea, Vietnam, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, El Salvador, Guatemala, Panama, Grenada, Chile, Jamaica, they invaded all of these countries. The Philippines, Cuba. <laughs> it's easier to mention the countries they haven't troubled. US foreign policy has been that of aggression. For years, the American government had a blank check to exercise its maniacal foreign policy. No one would have believed that America would do anything so dastardly and so evil because we all knew America. We all had a relationship with the United Snakes of America. We all either drank Coca-Cola. We knew about McDonald's Kentucky. We had Hollywood. We loved Sharon Stone. Oh, look at Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's Rambo. There's Superman. And you see the latest Spider-Man we all had a relationship with America, and that's what gave the U.S. its black check. But that black check has been signed and cashed, and America's credit is up, because people are beginning to recognize just how maniacal a U.S. foreign policy was, just at what expense others had to pay for that foreign policy. When you travel the world, you look at places in America going around saying, you need to bring democracy. Look at it. America said, let's bring democracy to Iraq. Yet right in its own backyard in Haiti, they overthrew the government of Aristide, an elected government, and replaced it with a puppet. Aristide said, I was kidnapped by American soldiers and taken away. And there wasn't even anyone in the media just put a microphone in his face. Who heard Aristide when he said, the Americans kidnapped me? Sorry? Panama! If you look at Panama, General Noriega. Noriega was kidnapped from Panama, taken to America. No courts in The Hague, no UN, no international mediators. The president of Panama was kidnapped and he's still in jail in America today. Does anyone ask where he is? What his trial was? Can we see the evidence? Noriega was trafficking drugs. Yes. But he was trafficking drugs openly for and with the American government. With the American government. 18 months before he was arrested, he paid four visits to the White House. Do you remember Oliver North? I don't suppose many of you do. There was a scandal, arms to Iraq and Iran. Do you know who was the architect of that? Sorry? Rumsfeld? Rumsfeld? Yes, sir. We were given the fall guy, we were told Oliver North was the man who took the bag and carried the bag for the Iran-Iraq Contra scandal. What they were doing, well, they were selling arms to both sides, they were trafficking drugs from Panama and Colombia, and Oliver North took the rap. But Oliver North wasn't the chap who was the architect, his main, his main line manager was who? Oliver North's main line manager was no one less than Colin Powell. 
that Jamaican Yadi. But the American government wanted to safeguard the career reputation of its highest ranking black officer. So they sacrificed Oliver North, a white man. So you see, there's justice in black and white. They saved the career of the most decorated black officer and sacrificed him with Oliver North. Oliver North was sentenced, but in fact, let's look at Oliver North's sentence. Oliver North was sentenced for selling arms, an arms dealer, selling arms to both sides. Doesn't spend a, a night in jail, gets a book contract, and he's now a celebrity. Isn't that wonderful? Yet General Noriega, a man who was dealing drugs with the US government, is in jail in the US. Under what charge, what right does the US government have to take away presidents? It's not new. Noriega wasn't new. The American administration has always considered its right to determine who our leader should be. You speak democracy out of one side of your mouth and dictatorship out the other. Look at Haiti, where you talk about uh, the free democracy. You go to Iraq to instill a democracy and overthrow a democracy in your backyard. Why don't you tell us about the condition of the people in Haiti, amongst the poorest in the world living under your so-called capitalist democracy? If they were socialists, if they were communists, it would be all over the press. Look at the failure of communism. Look at what socialism has done to these people. But here we have Haiti in America's backyard being reduced to nothing but a sweatshop for Americans. Most of America's baseball bats, most of America's Disney World merchandise is manufactured not in China, but in Haiti because they use Haiti as a sweatshop in their own backyard. Do we give a fuck about it? Hell no. Because when we leave here, you're going to go home to catch the fucking omnibus edition of The Simpsons. You're going to tune into Friends and then catch the latest edition of Big Brother. And then you're going to fuck for five minutes, wake up in the morning for work and repeat that same old fucking mundane cycle. You don't give a fuck, but this is the real shit not given to you by CNN, Sky or the BBC, but right here, the news you will not get, the news that seeps in from between the cracks. Only here in Hyde Park can you hear from Iraqis living the situation, embracing the situation. Only here can you hear from people who are from Darfur who give you their spin, their take. America said it was there for democracy. Let's look at the democracies that America has overthrown. America says it's in the Middle East to bring democracy. Hands up if you're Iraqi here. Hands up if you're Iranian. Iranian. Iranian, any more Iranians here? Iran. My friend, America says it's gone to the Middle East to bring democracy. Didn't you in the Middle East have democracy? Weren't you in Iran the first democracy? Under Mohammed Mossadegh, 1951, democratically elected by the people, for the people, populist leader of the people. Because the US, the British, it wasn't even the US, fuck the US. The British did not like the fact that prior to Mossadegh, 98% of Iran's oil revenue would find its way to the West. Mossadegh came to power and reversed that. He says, no, no, no. 98% stays here, 2% goes away. The British, incensed by Mossadegh's arrogance, persuaded the US government and the CIA to overthrow Mossadegh. It was the first successful coup ever thrown by the CIA. So don't say you've come to bring democracy because there was democracy already in the Middle East. In 1961, in the Congo, democratically elected Patrice Lumumba, first de 
democratically elected Prime Minister of the Congo. Overthrown by who? The CIA. 1973, Chile, Salvador Allende, democratically elected. On September the 11th, 1973, he was overthrown by who? The CIA. So what does America mean with this democracy? They did the same in, Gu in, in Guatemala, in the Dominican Republic, Abenz, Trujillo. What do you mean? In Ghana, you displaced Kwame Nkrumah. Look at the destruction you have wrought in Africa. Look at it. Let's be honest to ourselves. This world is nothing but a cake which has been divided up amongst imperialists to stuff their faces. The United Nations will not save you. The United Nations, look at it. Imagine the United Nations has as its secretary general a chicken bone fucking witch doctor, Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan has problems with himself, lacks self-esteem, and can't look white people in the face. Have you ever seen Kofi Annan at a meeting? Hello. Oh, How the fuck do you get one of them motherfuckers to be Secretary General? And he became Secretary General for two terms. How is that possible? Because the American government backed him. Look at it because they've already done a psychological profile on Kofi Annan. They already know he is a career diplomat. He ain't gonna say nothing out of the ordinary. He's from an African state, which isn't exactly one of the wealthiest, not one of the most militarily strong. So of course he's gonna have insecurity issues. So here we have a man with insecurity problems who doesn't need the UN, who needs fucking counselling. But they put him as the head of the UN. The UN is not run by these world leading thinkers and intellectuals. No, the UN is represented by representatives of the elite of every society. So therefore, whether you are Jamaican, Nigerian, British, American, French, Spanish, or Ethiopian, 